Yes, sir. Councilmember Dennehy? Here. Councilmember Gonzalez? Here. Councilmember Jaquez? Absent. Councilmember Reed? Absent. Councilmember B. Smith? Absent. Mayor Pro Tem Hamrick? Here. Mayor Smith? Absent. And just to let everyone know Mayor Smith is out celebrating spring break with her family. And I think Ryan is doing something similar. Yeah. So they will not be here tonight, but Rick, I guess that means that you're gonna be our, our main guy. I guess that's me. Um, nothing more to report than what we're talking about today, so. And can I, I, I would like to jump in here once and wish all the residents of Canyon City a happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank Happy you. St. Patrick's Day from, from the leprechaun. <laughs> well, we decided we've got uh, Tom and I here because Ryan referred to this as the Tom and Rick show and Rick and Tom show. You, you pick a direction which way you want to go, but all in, in the office, it's been the Tom and Rick show or the Rick and Tom show. We as, also as have- As long as there's hilarious commentary that comes along with that, that's great. <laughs> well, we can try to do that. Decided to do a PowerPoint for you just to give you somewhat of a rundown on the department, um, some highlights of 2020, what we project for this year, what we what we see happening this year. And uh, we can take some questions after that. So let's let's roll. Economic basically, um, the process of improving quality of life. And when you put it down into plain brass tacks, that's what we're trying to do in Canyon City is improve quality of life. A lot of different parts to that, and one thing that this this comments uh, this notes in here is that it's about social well-being. Which, when I started this position, it became pretty clear that this is not just economic development; it's community development. It's not you can't just look at the community from an economic perspective without looking at the entire picture. So that's a pretty good definition right there, and you can't go wrong with Wikipedia. So basically, economic development is a combination of several policies, plans, and actions designed to create new wealth for our community. Now, internally, we have a number of goals for economic development, um, the biggest of which um, are all of them. They all come together to create what we consider to be a vibrant community. Uh, there's, there's a lot to this position. We're trying to support existing businesses and help them expand. We're trying to attract new businesses, attract new industries, uh, enhance vibrancy, arts, entertainment, experience in the community, which is more what you might wanna call destination placemaking. We'd like to expand jobs. We need to create new primary jobs. Uh, a lot of people that work, that live in this community don't work in this community. And we'd like to be able to bring them into this community so they can enjoy our downtown or the rest of Canyon City and shop locally. We are working toward increasing trade and outside investment. Uh, that basically is expanding our capacity. If we can bring in industries that sell outside of our area, we bring outside dollars into our area, which will help us increase our capacity. Uh, we're looking to expand local ownership we're looking to minimize and capitalize on retail leakage, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, expand entrepreneurship, convert tourists to buyers and investors, and of course, create and promote commerce and arts-driven events that promote foot traffic and attract local and locals and visitors to Canyon City and downtown. So there's um, a lot to it. So before you, you go off that slide, it's okay if we, we chat here yeah. while you're... Yep. Yeah, so the... Um, one of the things that we've done is is implement the balanced scorecard. Mm -hmm. Now, economic development hasn't gone through that complete process yet. Is that correct? Correct. Only facilities and streets right now are going through it. Yes. Right. Okay. okay. So, so once you go through that process, the uh, hopefully what will you know the next iteration of this that we get to see, we'll see the balanced scorecard goals 
as well as sub, sub goals for, um, you know, to, to, to try and achieve all that. Right. Yeah. With metrics. Yeah. And yeah. And measurements. Yeah. We are, we are, we've been planning a department strategy meeting for the last couple of months. And it always seems to be something that comes in, gets in the way of it. The last time was, was all of those containers, those, those to-go cups. Mm -hmm. yeah. It became more of a team building function than a strategy function, but <laughs> So yeah, I, we will be taking on the balance scorecard in the in the not too distant future. Are are you aware of what's what's in that balance scorecard? What the breakdown is? Yeah, I don't have it with me, but yes. No, I, I mean, I I just yep. I I hear what you're saying, John, and I I um, applaud you for bringing that up. But I also believe that um, with this department, they're already in line with a lot of. Oh, you have a lot yeah. of the balance scorecard is yeah. economic development. Yeah, I believe yeah. That they're already in line with a lot of that. I, um, it's a, it, John is right. It's a matter of it's a matter of measuring it. Yeah. And having having basically scorecards and metrics and goals and you know, um, as I mentioned in the in the retreat Thursday, the process I was involved with was a little bit different than this, but it really did force you to think through everything. Yeah. And that's that'll be a, a benefit to this program. John, I need to know where you got that. Was it emailed? What this? Uh huh. Yes, this we this is the after our last meeting where we sat down and talked about this. Right, they sent out this revision 2.0. Okay, this is version 2.0. Thanks. Sorry. So, how do we achieve these goals? We do it by developing and diversifying housing stock. A lot of people don't necessarily consider housing an economic development feature. It's a, it's more tied to community development, but we have no place to put anybody right now. Uh, so that's really my first priority. Uh, I'm working pretty, uh, pretty hard trying to get some, and I contacted another housing developer today trying to get some interest in, in generating some housing here. We'll talk about one in a little bit. Uh, conducting, it, conducting a local market and industry analysis to determine likely industry matches for, for recruitment, and then identifying and planning possible business park locations and infrastructure requirements. Um, FEDC is running into this. And, and we are running into this. Businesses want existing infrastructure. They want to. They want to walk into a building that's already there for the most part, and we don't have any, really any at all. Um, we have an RFQ out that's uh, due next week to consultants to take. Um, I'm not. I don't know what how familiar you are with an EPA study that's that was done recently, uh, the one that we talked about. Um, it identifies some industries that would fit in our community. We're taking that and digging deeper into it really with the consultant. And that consultant will then identify a couple of different locations in this community that might be good for business parks or infrastructure. I had a number of conversations with site selectors and, and they made it pretty clear that if you're not ready to check all the boxes on their, on their requirements list, then you probably don't even wanna try. So this will be a huge first step to do that. Uh, providing small business training. We're working on that, rolling that out next week. Uh, simplifying communication and planning systems. And that I think just goes into general improvement of customer service. Providing development incentives, URA. There's also the life safety grant, facade grant, as the uh, primarily the incentives are coming from the URA. And as we grow the URA, there may be more in the future, such as um, loan funds or something like that. But you know, we'll, we'll talk about that more in the future. Quick. Yeah. Um, so you know how you said buildings are, we don't have a lot of buildings that are ready for people to walk into. Um, there's a lot of spaces downtown um, that are just not, they're not up to code and they're not. Right. Um, so how does that work if, a building owner without a without an existing business inside of that building, how can they tap into URA or can they? It's um, if there's not going to be an increment in tax, it doesn't make sense to do it. And it would probably have to be a significant increment in tax. Uh, generally, for you, for the TIF funding, we're looking at new developments are made similar to the St. Cloud or, or, you know, renovation of major major aged buildings that are going to cost a ton of money 
to renovate. In the future, uh, as is the case with the, the sewer line near First Street, the Water, Water Street sewer line. Oh, okay. The, the URA may have a bank account that can, use, that can be used for projects like that. Okay. And that, that, you know, that depends on getting TIF projects out there, getting the, the tax increment after the reimbursement of those tax dollars to the investor, we start to collect that money. So that type of a bank account or so to speak will take a while to okay. create. Thanks. And yeah, just to plant, a, you know, kind of further that and maybe plant an idea, plant a seed here. There, the, we do have the COVID infrastructure money that's going to be coming in. The, and Rob Brown got, grabbed me this morning and said, hey, you guys should consider taking a chunk of that money and putting it in the URA mm -hmm. uh, so that there's actually immediate money available. Um, and so I think that's a very that's good idea. The, I'll, I'll let you take that message to Ryan. I'll, I think that's an excellent idea. We're, we're evaluating that whole package right now. It's, right. it's about 700 pages of, of, of sleep ready reading to do. Rick, I got a quick question for you. As you know, I, and I know the business, small business training is coming up because you know we're watching that as well. And um, are we working what much with the SBA and and bringing in and any of, you know, I, I think one thing that a lot of people miss is there's so much that the SBA can do. You know, even with retired, the senior mentoring program and all that that they do, and and it's all available. They're, they're it's out of Pueblo, but but they'll come here. I mean, they've had mm -hmm. meetings here. Um, and, and I think that's something that if we could even even help spread that word, because that's a that's just a great source. And if, you know, we take some of these people who've been in a business for so long mm -hmm. and and there's so many who have been in the, probably the similar business, they can give them just a few insights. And I know times are changing, but there's still a wealth of knowledge there. Well, let Tom come in on that. Yeah, so we actually, um, so there's the SBA, the Small Business Administration, um, and we brought them in uh, late fall, early winter and kind of took them on a tour of the community and made sure that we spread some of the information that they have along the lines of the low interest loans, those sort of things. Um, but then there's also the Small Business Development Center that's based out of Pueblo and covers a four or five county area. Yeah. And we've been working closely with them. Their director started in March last year mm -hmm. and I started in October. And so we've both been pretty new to the roles, but pretty, quickly have gotten on board with each other. Uh, we, they hired Alan Tormelin, who's a former community banker here in Canyon City. So now we have a local presence for the SBDC. Um, as you mentioned, there's a training happening at the end of the month, uh, all around e-commerce, how to get your, your business online, how to either, the importance of having a digital presence, whether that's social media, website, e-commerce, and we are actually attaching uh, to that the opportunity to apply for grants. Um, it's CARES Act money. It's a partnership with the Chamber and the SBDC. If you attend two of the four trainings that we have on this, you can apply. And we've got vendors available who can, whether it's digital marketing, whether it's revamping your website, or if you want a full-blown e-commerce site. Um, we can contribute up to a thousand dollars toward those projects. So it's definitely something that is top of mind for us. We've also, we also had a kind of welcome to the community or an introduction, I guess, for Alan Tormelin at Fremont Provisions two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and made sure to invite the business community. So it's, that's an important partnership. And that was good turnout. It was, I was surprised yeah, that was, was good turnout there. A yeah, couple dozen they, folks anyway. They, they brought some of the seniors. They did that once um, back in 2016, 17. They had it at a local restaurant. And, uh, and that's where I got to meet a lot of them and especially the seniors. And it was, it was just neat talking to them and how they just want to help. You know, they're bored in their lives. I, I don't want to say they're bored in their lives, but they they have so much success and they're no longer in it and mm -hmm. they want to just help continue on. So I think that's a great resource that we, and I, and it's great that you've looked into it. Thank you. Yeah. And then, and another thing came out of the SBA um, visit. Uh, we, we were supposed to have the USDA here with them, but they, they couldn't show up, but um, they introduced us to a, an organization in Denver called Mikasa, which is Generally speaking, it's it's a it's targeted toward women enterprises, 
and we've directed a number of, uh, well, a couple, not a number, just a couple of businesses locally to them to see if there may be some assistance because they're, they're doing some training, but they're also, um, we haven't quite tapped into that yet, but they're also doing some sort of grant they are offering and, and um, a couple of the local businesses that have really kind of been hit hard. We've sent them their way just to hopefully come up with another road for some assistance, you know, so yeah, definitely some, some efforts toward helping businesses and, you know, to, to give credit to the chamber too, uh, they've gone through a lot since COVID hit. Uh, and we, we reached out to them with this program and they were more than happy to work with this program and work with tech companies outside of membership to help this happen. So um, it's good cooperative effort, good partnership. So where did I leave off? Um, num you know, I, well, obviously I don't need to read everything here, but it's really all about assisting businesses, expanding businesses, um, and we'll get more into that a little bit here, uh, attracting new industries. And when I talked about not having property, not having locations, it's really for the new industries that we want to attract in the area. The primary jobs really have nowhere to go right now. Um, we do have vacancies downtown, unfortunately, several of them that we need to fill. This is our department. Uh, this is the first time Canyon City's ever had three people in economic development. Um, Brandy, that everybody in this community probably knows, and if they don't, they're not, they're not paying attention. She's been very, very active at grant R&D, grant writing, very much a community advocate in the city, um, very much a community advocate in the city, but very strong in community relations and support. I am the department manager. I'm also involved with diversifying, diversifying industry, attracting primary jobs, and then urban renewal. And Tom, of course, is small business retention and expansion and Main Street uh, program management. So um, one of the reasons that Ryan wanted to go this direction with the position is because when he was in this position, he found himself spending so much time on one group of businesses that he couldn't really divide his time and spend more time on recruitment. Uh, so it's working out pretty well right now. We don't have community development. We, we, that's why Brandy is in our department right now. And it's a very, very good fit. These two make me look really good. They really do. We, we have a couple of good hires here. On the grant side, these are 2020 highlights. This is the grant activity for 2020. Total grants of $2,468,000, or excuse me, $2,468, basically. Twenty four. Excuse me, there you go, 2.47, I'll round it up, million dollars. One, over one million of that is the, is the work that Brandy did to go attract grants, to go find grants for businesses, for community, nonprofits, for city departments, police department, uh, co-responder, you name it. Uh, one point, well, the 1.37 CARES Act funding is the, the 2020 CARES Act that we spent in 2020. Uh, we have $470,000 remaining that they want us to spend pretty quickly. And we are in the process of spending that. Uh, some very, very good effort on her part. On the right is a listing of all of that activity. And, it, and it's, a broad, it's a broad swath of the community, it really is. Uh, economic development highlights, COVID-19 kind of defined all of 2020. I started with COVID-19. Tom started in the middle of COVID-19. Brandy started right before COVID-19. Uh, really 2020 activity was helping businesses respond and survive. A lot of, a lot of, uh, I don't want to say hand-holding because they, I don't, you know, I wouldn't re refer to it that way, but a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with business owners, helping them navigate PPP, helping them navigate idle, helping them navigate grants, helping them work together to come up with some uh, I guess you could say consistency between them, the restaurants in particular, and the bars, helping them stay open. Uh, very, very frustrating time for the, for the businesses. So worked very hard to work with them one-on-one. -on -one. We signed on, we got a contract with Buxton Retail Analytics. I will have a number of slides on that a little bit later. Again, work with restaurants and bar owners, the next one we talked about. 
um, set up the Mayor's Industry Advisory Council, and that is that it's it's in its infancy, but it's growing, and the industry advisory groups. Uh, it's, it's a communication system that basically will help area businesses communicate directly with the city. Uh, industry advisory groups are intended to have potentially uh, council members, a council member in each one. So the, each industry advisory group can have a council member, member there to bounce ideas off of. And um, some pretty good turnout for that. Go ahead. Um, who determined who was on the mayor advisory council? I did a, a did a kind of a search of who we thought industry wise we wanted to have a part of it, mm -hmm. and and invited those people. Some of them were part of the um, uh, COVID nineteen business leaders group or the strategic planning group, uh, and we we brought them together for the mayor. Uh, we're seeing now that we had there's there's a couple of under, other industry directions we need to go to to include some more people, but if you have other ideas, no, I'm. I'm curious to know more about it. I know we had an email come out. Um, I'm happy to visit with you anytime okay. to talk about it. All right, yeah. thanks. And you may be hit up by one of the industry groups to that, you know, I'm requesting that they have a council member on it. Uh, Main Street program affiliation. Uh, we, we were part of the Main Street program. We still are, we're affiliate members. And that's one of the reasons that Tom is here. He can talk about that a little bit more later if you'd like. Uh, we were awarded a grant for industry market analysis. That's the industry study that I'd mentioned before. And that's a $60,000 study that's gonna be done within the next couple of months. And then of course we established a new position as a grant writer and small business and Main Street program manager. Small business updates. Um, would you like to comment on any of these? Sure, I guess I'd just say that we have in the last couple months here seen a number of new businesses start. We've got, uh, as you can see, we've got a number that are in the works here, uh, both expanding and moving in. It seems like a good sign that things maybe are turning the corner. And I also see it as really a sign that people are excited about the direction downtown is going, Canyon City is going. Um, you don't open up downtown unless you've got sort of a sense of optimism of, of where this area is headed. And so it's really exciting to see some of our longtime stalwart businesses, Worlds in Brewing, the hand or and Red Canyon Cycles expanding. That's super encouraging. Um, Autumn's Attic and Yarn and Dangerous both are finding new spaces because they were just tapped out. Um, and so that's opening up smaller spaces, which now, I mean, that's sort of the churn that you want to see as everyone keeps moving up into bigger spaces, opening up some some new space for other businesses to move in. It's a really good, uh, been a really good start to the year after what was a very, very long 2020. And, um, you know, a lot of discouragement in the fall. There was a, a super strong holiday season. Um, reports I'm getting from businesses as I walk around is early spring here has been good. Um, super encouraging. I've been talking a lot about, hey, we still have CARES Act money left. What kind of needs do we have? And it's kind of been light on suggestions, which I say is a good sign that people are feeling a lot healthier about where their business is. Yep, yep. Great. They're gonna be in uh, Colby and Beth's event center, the Canyon Royal event center on the left where okay. there used to be um, the barbecue. Chicago Bob's. Yeah, Chicago Bob's used okay. to be in there. And what is, what is Ber Berkshire Hathaway? It's a real estate company. Okay. The, the building next to Nirvana that okay. was a law office, they bought that and they're, 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 they're opening up a, a real estate office here. I think they're, mo they're usually in larger metropolitan areas. So it's kind of impressive to see them coming here. They're pretty excited about it, actually. They were part, they were at the chamber banquet Friday night too, and, and pretty excited about being here. Active redevelopment projects, of course, we, know, we all know about this. Hotel St. Cloud, Fremont National Bank, and St. Scholastica. Um, unbridled purchased the St. Scholastica building that's in that picture right there. And uh, of course, the St. Cloud, they, they have, they've secured new lending as of Tuesday. So, um, so far all 
the sails are up and the and the ships are moving. So, so they have closed on the Saint Scholastica building. They, I believe, they did close on the Saint Scholastica building just very recently. They're they're talking about some water taps now and and rearranging water. Pardon me. Uh, as far as the lending for the Saint Cloud, yeah, they had to change their their lender, but that that happened pretty quickly. We we worked with them. A week and a half ago, I think they let us know that they had a problem, and we, we sent Alan Tormelin out there and uh, got him in touch with a few others, but they secured some lending pretty quickly. And then, of course, uh, Fremont National Bank, uh, we can see is, is in the works right now. City-owned development projects. Again, everything that we know about here, Canyon Village in the clock tower, uh, that will come back to life again next year when we start to talk about renovations to the clock tower parking lot and third street and the third street block of main street all kind of has to be tied in we can't just create it where it is right now um the constantino's lot once everything and i need to follow up on this uh since we've since we've had a change in city engineer uh once we know that everything is set to go we will send that out for rfp and get some interested investors in in that lot and then, of course, Skyline Steel Riverfront, uh, we see there that's, that's a concept that was generated. And um, with the sewer line going in, it gives now the ice plant a chance to start renovation. I'm not sure of their timing. I'm going to be checking on that. But um, that could all be happening very, very quickly. We still have to work on Acorn Petroleum, work with Acorn Petroleum. Um, and hopefully that won't be too difficult. But... Private development projects. There's a lot of stuff going on out there right now. Uh, multifamily, we talked about the importance of family or multifamily housing. The field and central property is a vacant property. There's one parcel that was sold on that. There's a house on it. Uh, there's 12 acres there that they're gonna combine into one property and develop that into about a hundred units of housing. I don't know if it's condos or if it's rentals. It's gonna be sixplex type. Of, of it's that missing middle, missing middle type housing that we don't have in this community. Uh, private multifamily housing developer, that's what I met with them a few weeks ago. And um, they're interested in talking more about the area, but they're very, very busy. And um, I'll keep on them to see where they are. And I also contacted another developer in Minneapolis, uh, excuse me, Nebraska. She lives in Minneapolis. And I'm trying to they already told me once that they, they didn't have the capacity to do it, but that was six months ago, and I'm going to keep tapping on their door to see if they have the capacity. Regional Sports Park, that's east of Four Mile Parkway on uh, McKenzie Ranch property. That's in the conceptual mode at this point, pre-planning. They're looking for investors. Uh, they did come to the city. We talked to them about modifying their plans so they're closer to actual existing infrastructure. They would, they would have to be um, annexed into the city and they started their project out too far to really make it affordable. So they're modifying their plans at this point to still make that happen. Uh, potential FEDC retail project west of Four Mile Parkway, they're, they're looking at a few different locations, but that's just one of them. The other two locations I suspect are, are in the county. Um, it's, a, it's a national retailer of sorts. Uh, um, we don't really have a whole lot of, a lot of detail on it because he's got an NDA on that one. I'm working with a developer interested in building for a department store. Um, he's also, you see over there on the right side, fire station with QSR. QSR stands for quick serve restaurant. He's the developer that's interested. He's got a letter of intent for the, to put a restaurant in front of the fire station. He's also interested in doing a development for a Kohl's or a Ross clothing store or something like that. Uh, so we're going to be talking more about that. The old Jewett's building is under contract. We're working with them to, to develop, to, to come up with some uh, interested fit, I guess you could say, businesses to go in there. There's talk of a Kroger kiosk style gas station on the corner of 15th and 50, where that hotel is right now. And I say kiosk because it's not a full convenience store. It's just the smaller little kiosk building that gives a little bit more room in that space. And a convenience for uh, a convenience store in the KBOB's former site, again, the fire station, and of course the ice plant we talked about. 
So those are all active developments. There are more that, that we don't know about that, um, again, are NDA with FEDC. Uh, they're probably not directly in the city, but there's a lot of interest in the area. There is another gentleman who's interested in starting some businesses in Canyon City, uh, very, very much in the infancy stage. He's working on a building right now in the county, uh, running into problems with the county. So the, the customer service issues that the city's known for, the county is now exercising, I guess you could say. Uh, industry advisory groups, I mentioned that briefly. The Mayor's Industry Advisory Council graphic on the right kind of shows you the, the intent. Um, the industry groups are self-directed. They're, they're intended to be more of like a local, local industry association. Industry groups get together, businesses get together, they talk about their industries, their challenges, and they work together to solve problems like similar to what the restaurants did and the bars during COVID. Each again would have a representative from the council, if at all possible. We have an industry group started for recreation companies. We have an industry, industry group that's basically FCTC is going to be an industry group. We are developing one for downtown. What was a DBA at one point will be a downtown, likely a downtown sector partner with this group. Um, we, we need to, and, and there's a manufacturing group that's being developed right now as well. So it gives you an idea of what, of the concept of um, communicating between businesses in the city. Huge problem during COVID, huge problem during COVID. This is what I feel like our city is missing as far as communicating to different uh, groups in our community sectors yeah yeah sectors I feel like like we're all on different pages um, and this this is genius it'll help bring it together so well, I, I there's really a lot like of interest this. in it too huh there's a lot of interest in it too that's wonderful mm -hmm. I, I think that um, a lot of times uh, one one group might feel like another group is fighting them on something and that's not what's really happening at all and it you know it gets kind of turned around so i think this mm -hmm. will help put a lot of a lot of groups on the same page yeah so, and it'll help um build some bridges yeah yeah that's what i was trying that's, to say that, <laughs> there's there's a need for bridges out there uh spend a little time on buxton buxton is a is a retail or retail analytics company uh we've talked about it a little bit the three squares we see here, rectangles we see here, retail, restaurant, consumer services, public sector, cons commercial real estate. This is how we're basically using the Buxton software package. We don't really delve into healthcare in, with our package. Um, basically, we're, we're helping retailers understand their customers so they can optimize their marketing and advertising. We are um, we do in depth in insights about residents, workforce, visitors, tools to attract and retain retailers and businesses. This is how we match businesses with our community. What what would be a good fit here? This is one of the ways we're doing it. And the commercial commercial real estate analyze any property and match. That's what I just mentioned. Match key success metrics to eat, to any brand. Uh, literally, I can I can right click on Canyon City do a report, run a report, enter the name of a restaurant or a department store. It'll pull up that restaurant and compare our community to 10 to 50 other communities in the United States. It's a very, very powerful. So how do we use it? It's basically what we said, research and identify possible retail matches for vacant buildings, help local businesses better understand their target customer base, analyze local market dynamics and leakage to explore opportunities, and market our community to potential retail, commercial, and hospitality investors. Buxton provided us with a, a 20 matches, 20 retail, rest, retail and restaurant matches that would be good for our community. In other words, they did some of the analysis that we can do. They did it for us, and they provide us contact information with, for these people, for these companies. I've contacted several of them so far. Some of them are pretty close matches with what we already have, uh, such as Boot Barn. That's pretty close to um, Big R. 
and tractor supply. The, the clothing and, and, you know, the clothing you find in those two stores is pretty close to Booth Barn. So it's, it's kind of an analysis of what would fit, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we need it. There were four on here, four or five on here that they suggested that Ryan and I went through and thought that would not be a good fit. So we asked them to take them out. And this was part of their discussion with us too. They said they might not be. You, we know our local market better than they do really. Uh, so they took those out and added five more. I can't tell you which ones they are at the moment, but Ross is a good fit. Ross, Ross expressed some interest in being here, but we don't have the square footage for them. We're short on that. And that's when I started to talk to this investor about developing, building, uh, building to suit for a, a department store. Even the, the old bells? It's too small. It's too small. Well, I do, I think Sirius Texas Barbecue would fit just fine. I think it would too. <laughs> I think it would too. The challenge I'm having is that nobody's, I'm not able to get through to anybody right now. Oh, I'm I'll trying. Go, I'll, go, I'll go visit them. Uh, yeah, you, all right. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, so far, you know, Qdoba would be a great fit. Popeyes would be a great fit. Popeyes was a possibility. There was a there was a, a convenience store that was coming in that was also working with Popeyes, but that didn't happen. So now we have Kentucky Fried Chicken coming in. Uh, but these are all companies that I'm researching a little bit deeper and contacting. Some of them I've already contacted. Several of them. Rick. Just out of curiosity, just because I've never heard of it. What's five below? Yeah, I was wondering the same. It's a it's similar to a thrift, not a thrift store, but a like a dollar store, but okay. everything's below five bucks. Okay. And it looks like it'd be a good fit here. And they're another mm -hmm. one that hasn't contacted that I haven't been able to get a hold of. Was that up there? So we can also do our own matches. And uh, Joe's Crab Shack, I did because Stan Bullis made a comment to to, ride to me or somebody thinking that Joe's Crab Shack was one of them that was gonna be a, you know, interested in coming here, but, or that I was trying to put in one of their facilities, but it didn't, it wasn't. But they're a decent fit, except for, and this is where we run into the problem, the ideal customer count. Mm -hmm. On just about everything, we are very, very low. Doesn't mean we can't get a restaurant, doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but um, it does show that we're low. It does then compare the ideal customer count, ideal customer ratio, and I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, it does compare then to 10 to 50 other establishments they have locally or around the country. So we can get a, vis a visual comparison of how Canyon City compares to specific markets of these restaurants, which helps a ton to identify maybe who we should contact because maybe, the, maybe Joe's Crab Shack has a bunch of communities that have the same low customer count and maybe they're doing very very well but I, and i think the other thing we also need to look at when we look at that is median incomes and i mean that's that's extremely important because that's even a low density community you could have a very the, higher median income correct and that gets into the to yeah. the ideal customer similarity and i'll show you that in just a second one of the ways we use this uh, and this is primarily for business owners downtown now uh, and we've done this with a number of them. We can, we can geofence their property and find out based on cell phone data. And if the cell phone data can be tracked back to their house, it'll also work into their credit card data. It won't give us specifics about who they are, what they're buying, anything like that. It just kind of creates a profile, a buying profile, so to speak. What they like to do, where they like to stay, what they like to buy, that sort of a thing. Big brother. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And then that translates into this type of information. This is actually um, Centennial Park. This is Centennial Park over, I don't remember how many months this was or, yeah. But this is the traffic that we see at Centennial Park. If you look at a lot of our businesses, if you look at a lot of traffic in Canyon City businesses in general and in Canyon City, you see a lot of that big, tall red bar right there, N46, O51, M44, but N46 is often the biggest one. This is telling us that if Centennial Park was a business, this is the primary customer profile. This is all based on Experian data. This is all Experian data right here. 
And by looking at this N46, we find out that N46 is called a True Grit American. Sounds like a good fit for Canyon City. They are, uh, the head of household is 36 to 45, estimated household income is 50 to 75, getting to your, getting to your income comment. Uh, the, the, the thing that really stands out though, from a marketing perspective is on the right, channel preference and technology ad ad adoption. You can see that there's one small cell phone highlighted there. They're not big into technology. They have a cell phone, might be a flip phone, but they have a cell phone. They probably don't have tablets. Um, they don't use their cell phone a lot. And if you look at the channel preference, television is very low. So did, the channel preference, did I add one here that? Yes, I did, okay. Uh, here we have another look at the channel, channel, channel preference. This one is engagement channels. We have here a grid that goes from zero to 200. 100 is median, or we'll call it average. I'm not gonna say it's median. But if you look at this age group, this category of people, and this is digital savvy, this is 051. They are 133% more likely to use digital video for engagement. Uh, they're very, in like, very likely to use digital texting, SMS texting for engagement. Very likely to use radio. They are not gonna use newspapers. They're not gonna use digital news. Try to tell me the difference between digital video and digital news, I'm not quite certain. But this tells business owners how to market to their customers. If you wanna to try to attract new businesses, let's say you wanna to try to attract the J36, which is the yellow one. They don't necessarily appear to be um, great customers. Maybe they visit your store, but they're not buying anything. Um, you can also look up what J36 is, find out how they advertise and, and advertise directly to them through the media that they use to communicate. So this is the power of Buxton for our local businesses. It's very, very effective. There's another way that we can use this on a broader scale, this, this right here is Raft Masters and Colorado Jeep Tours. This is telling us where all of their customers come from in a year. Um, they, as a tour company, kind of know where they come from, but this really kind of highlights the regions. It supports the regions that they think maybe do or do not have a lot of customers coming to them. Uh, but it also then will do the same thing as this does and identify what they, how they communicate, who they are. Um, ironically, they get a lot of the same age group as the O51s, which I believe, I don't have the ages of those. In other words, elderly people do spend money and they do spend money at Colorado Jeep Tours and Rap Masters. So people that you wouldn't expect to spend money do because a lot of their customers are lower income people. Uh, but this, we can do this for most, well, we do this for any business really uh, and provide them really a feedback of maybe the market. If, they if they're a regional business, uh, we can kind of zero in on the regions in the United States. So it's a very powerful tool uh, this one's called Mobilytics, but most of the businesses downtown wouldn't benefit from this one because most of the business downtown is going to come from here, Colorado Springs, Pueblo, Denver, uh, maybe Salida. We don't see a lot of traffic necessarily coming this way from Salida, but really Colorado Springs, Pueblo, and Denver is the majority of outside customers coming here. And this is an interesting thing. Um, this is kind of a quiz. When Ryan and I were looking at this package, the salesman get, threw up this chart, and this is a general merchandise category. Each of the lines, the vertical lines you see is a day from January all the way up to April, let's say probably 15th, roughly, the day, probably two days before we had this meeting. Uh, what you're looking at is a trend line. The green trend line is 2020. The orange trend line or red trend line is 2019. So this is during COVID, basically. 
The two that I've circled up there, March around the March 13th time frame. Can you guess what that would represent? <laughs> the day before the lockdown. <laughs> Toilet, Toilet paper, paper disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. We saw, you can see if we, when we're looking at these reports, wow. if we look up hotels, we can see when Whitewater yeah. is, we can see when Flashback is, we can, we can see when Blossom is. We see this data on, this, uh, on these reports so we can get supporting information on, on the benefits of, of the events that we have and the attraction of people from outside the area. So several ways to use it. One of them, um, and I'll let Tom talk about this if you want more information on it. Uh, if you remember, there was gonna be something called LSMX in, with the Buxton package, local store marketing. So our local businesses could use LSMX and do their own social media marketing. They didn't get any interest from any of their businesses for that package, so they discontinued it. And I said, well, we based our purchase on that. So they created for us a new marketing plan that will actually be more effective than LSMX because they couldn't tell us exactly who they were targeting when they did that. And now they're using the data that we can generate to find, to help our businesses target their customers with these packages. Uh, it's actually a better program and they're willing to do it simply because they're not spending the resources now in LSMX. And I can let Tom speak more about that if, you, if you'd like to know more about that. And that's all I've got. So, so maybe the, uh, this is probably a question for both of you, but what, what's kind of the, the top three things that you've learned from Buxton that, that kind of stick out in your minds? Uh, you know, I know that uh, Tom, you bet uh, Rotary today, you quoted something that I thought was a pretty interesting factoid, but, but what, what do you, you know, each of you, what do you think are the top three or so things that, that you've learned from Buxton? Go ahead. So for me, it's been a lot of um, familiarization really with the community and what we have available. Um, I think the customer profiles really is, and I come from a little bit of a marketing kind of background. So having that information of, okay, how do I reach you? What's your age? What, I mean, where are you, what stage of life are you in? Do you have kids or if you, are you an empty nester? Are you traveling? Those sort of things are, um, super important to know to be able to target exactly your message to that audience and uh, over and over and over again we see that that N46 is primarily our target um, but that as Rick said that doesn't mean that's the only target there's there's several of those that consistently stand out and with that tool you can look at okay Overwhelmingly, especially downtown where I've been focusing, looking at this information, overwhelmingly it's local visitors. What happens when you start looking at Pueblo or Colorado Springs or Denver, the people who are visiting here and spending money and those values change, those customer profiles change and the data, the mobilitics data lets you get down, in some cases down to the neighborhood, well, it lets you get down to the house, but you can see, you can see sometimes clusters of neighborhoods of this is the part of town that's visiting us. So now you can geofence and you can make sure your ads online are actually targeting that neighborhood. And you can design those ads to say something different than what you might say to your locals. Um, so to me, that's that ability to target very specifically and very discrete audiences, depending on whether you're trying to bring in visitors versus letting the locals know that you've got an after work special um, are it's a huge advantage. And all this data is just based on where these people go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's where they go, how they shop. Yeah, it, if, it, if it can track one thing you notice on the reports is that'll tell you how many it'll they'll tell you how many how many phones registered but then it'll also show you tell you how show you how many were tracked back to a home and once it can track it back to a home um it'll track where they if they keep their location services on all the time it'll track wherever they go you know and and it can we don't get this granular on the on the data but it they can get down to somebody in a household where they've gone 
Big Brother, you know, look in your Google history. You know, I, you'll, I know I turned mine off. <laughs> you'll see you'll see where you've gone, because, and that's the know, kind of data they get. They know I, they know to. how when people are they know where people live okay. kind of by how how much time they're spending in one location at night yeah. how long the, how long their phone is sitting there yeah um they know where they work and they separate out the reports that way it's a little so scary i feel I, I i wrote this to tim um and i i wrote i feel like i'm watching the explained version of the social dilemma Dr. <laughs> Um, and ironically, we have somebody from the social dilemma living here, right? Now. Yeah. Um, so are there any privacy concerns with the data that we're collecting? No, like, because we can't get down that to that level. Okay. No, we can't. We can't even get close to that level. Okay. Really, what we're seeing is trends. Trends. So, yeah. so if somebody were to go shop somewhere, buy something, and be tracked back to a home, um, your, the data you're receiving is, is saying they went to a home. We don't know if it's their home. Correct. Um, and we don't even know who they are. We just okay. know a cell phone was tracked back to a home and it's tied to this classification of person. And this is only if your location services are on, of course. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. I did one of Centennial Park, uh, one of the one of the trailheads actually. And it's like people obviously didn't have their phones with them or didn't have them on, you know, because there wasn't a, nothing really appeared. Um, I guess, I guess to answer your question, uh, my, the three things for me, one, one thing that Tom talked about is dead on, you know, the ability for custom, for businesses to see who their customers are, I think is invaluable. I mean, Absolutely. It, it's invaluable. Absolutely. And we, we intend to put that out there as much as we possibly can. We put it out there for several businesses, but you know, we baby steps, I guess you could say, we don't see the successes yet with the businesses because there's more work that has to be done on their end um, and it's something new. So we have to continue walking down the road with them. Uh, the LSMX termination, I guess you could say, slowed things down too a little bit because that's one thing that we were gonna provide them, uh, but it disappeared. So that complicated things a little bit, but that's very, very valuable. Another thing to me is, is um, the matching, the retail matching. You know, it, you, you hear people say, this would be a great, great location for Chick-fil-A. That's the number one Chick-fil-A, natural yeah. groceries. Natural groceries was, was actually identified as a match. Chick-fil-A was not. Um, I thought Kohl's would be a good match. Not even close when I looked it up. You know, the type of clothing they have there, the pricing they have, I thought it'd be a great match. It just wasn't even close. So it really helps you determine what direction to go, where you'd be spinning wheels if you were going there, you know. Um, so it, it gives us some justification for action, I guess you could say, or justification for non-action. You know, I don't want to waste, waste time. Uh, the other one is really a confirmation of what We've thought of the community all along, you know, the types of people we have here. Um, it gives us a good, good direction on, on uh, targeting industry, targeting jobs. It really solidifies that our, our population is aging. You know, we have more, Ryan mentioned this the other day again too, and this is a morbid thing to say, but we have more deaths than births. You know, and that's not that's not a growth path. And if we want to attract more businesses, more industry, there's kind of a chicken and an egg. We need to have the people here. We need to have the the labor pool here. Um, but if we don't, you know, it, it's just really confirmation that we need to steer in certain directions to attract the types of jobs that we need, the types of people that we need. There are not a lot of jobs where where people can go. I mean, like Ross or no. Um, you know, make a, a fairly decent wage without an education. Yep. We hear it all the time. We, Tom and I entertained a couple in our office a um, week and a half ago or so that were, that were, you know, brainstorming some business ideas. And they're, they're part of the Mennonite community. Uh -huh. And they, they've got some resources and they want to start a business or, or a hotel or something like that. And their big thing is that the, the women in, in their 
population, I guess you could say, in their circles, can't find work. You know, and that's very common. When I moved here, I couldn't find work. My wife had a job, but I couldn't find work. It's always the spouse or the partner that mm -hmm. can't find something. But, you know, it all ties together. We need, we need jobs here so people can enjoy downtown. So this was a good confirmation of that. It's a very, very powerful tool though, mm -hmm. really is. Um, so are you, is this finished? Mm -hmm. Your presentation? Okay. Um, just one thing I wanna say, cause I, I read it, I hear it. People say it all the time. They need to bring this in. They need to bring that in. They need to do this. They need to do that. And I just need to say for the record that we as a city don't bring these businesses in. Like we don't provide them with a business. They have to choose to want to come here. And the only reason we can, or the only way we can do that is to continue to make our city more beautiful and more inviting. And, and so uh, go ahead. No, you're right. Okay. Um, so I just want to make it clear that you guys are working hard to bring what might come our way, but you don't decide as a city, we don't decide what comes here. So all we can do is recruit. That's right. And I appreciate that you're doing that because, um, without that, we can't grow. Well, even, even Rob made a comment this morning at FEDC's meeting that, you know, you, you, even the ones you know you're not going to get, sometimes you have to go after them just to find out, find, learn the process and, and, you know, see where, see where you land, I guess you could say, but you might get beat up in the process, you know, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, it's Did really all about recruitment. Well, and, and then one thing is, you know, on, and on some businesses, once they decide to come here, you know, there's a few incentives that you know, can be passed down the line. Um, but the main thing is, is, you know, it's, it's the main thing is, it's great that we now have a good economic development team that's going out and, and seeking and trying to bring businesses in, into the community. And, uh, and it, and this is a tough community. I mean, you know, the way, I mean, and, and, and I have a very strong economic background and, and I used to work for the SBA, you know, and, uh, this is a tough, this is a tough community for that. You know, when you have the, the correctional facilities here and that, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's our number one employer here. And, and it's, it's just a, it's a totally different deal than is when you were talking about a little town with this, you know, it's, you know, we're a little town, but we're a little town with, with very big, or very, uh, with the Department of Corrections is a very big employer but yet it's just one industry. And that's where, that's, as, as you know, we're lacking. Yeah, we got inner role and, but you know, that's where we're lacking. And, uh, and that's where hopefully we can develop some things, you know, whether service wise or anything to, to come in. And I, I commend what you guys are doing. I think you're doing a great job. Well, that, that is the re one of the reasons for the industry advisory groups to, to sit down. Cause interval was before COVID they were planning an expansion. Yep. And now they may be now they may be again, but you know, um, and I intend to sit in on the the industry advisory group, the manufacturing one. Um, but that's where you have the conversations about you know what do you need here in this community? How can are you are you getting product from Colorado Springs that we should have here? Are you getting it from Alamosa that we should have here? Uh, those types of conversations need to happen. I have one other quick question. Um, let's say a developer does come in and they're looking for something that maybe we don't have in the city. Do you have the connections available to show some, you know, some property in the county? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good I work really closely with Rob. Okay, great. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. He and I are actually working on a, well, we're involved pretty together with the Abbey. Um, the, the four mile project, oh, yeah. okay. I've got a little bit more information than, I think most do because I'm trying to work with him on possibly parceling off some of that to a, to a developer. Um, that, you know, that's, it's, it's a fascinating industry. It's a fascinating job because there's so many different directions and so many tentacles to it. Um, and in, in conversations with the site selectors is, is, you know, if you get a request for information and you can't fill, check all those boxes, well, we need to know what those boxes are. You know, right. we need to know we need to know where we should be in order to check off those boxes. There's just a lot to it. 
Okay. So part of what you showed us was the, uh, you know, fit for chains, uh, you know, the Chick-fil-A's and Taco John's, stuff like that coming into town. And that, that in a way, sometimes that might be a, a you know, a round peg in a square hole. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you look at it? Is it possible to use Buxton to look at it the other way? That, for instance, if, if what this town needs is a, you know, and, and fill in the blank kind of thing, like, like selling left-handed monkey wrenches or something like that. I mean, is there, can you get the actual, could you use it to develop ideas for businesses that need to start rather than chains that need to come in? To some extent we can. Um, Tom's nodding his head, so I'll, I'll let him answer too. Um, doing the matches, you know, some of it is kind of a hunt and peck. What, what do we think would work here? And, and any one of you, if you have business ideas that you'd like to, that you think we should try to attract, let me know and we'll see what we can find out. But some of it is, is, you know, we have a, we have a hunch that this would be good here and we mm -hmm. can do a retail match of it or a, doesn't even have to be a retail match. We can just, we can, we can also contact Buxton and have them do more of an in-depth dive. Um, what, what were your, what were your thoughts? I was going to say there, I think you can use it between the, the leakage, retail leakage information that Buxton provides and some other resources we mm -hmm. have um, and that match ability. I mean, you can sort of reverse engineer that. Um, there's, there's lots of business information where you can go and look at one of these, like the barbecue chain and say, okay, well, what's the demographic they're aiming for? Um, so you can pull that together, re reverse engineer it to some extent, but sort of like Dolly was saying, you, you know, we can say, look, we think this will fit, but you still need a business owner who yeah. says, oh, well, I want to open a barbecue joint. Um, you still, it, we can put that information out there as it seems like this is a good fit here. Um, but, but then it's, it's really about connecting who wants to start that business. And there's, there's probably a little bit more to it than that, because even though, a, a, you know, a barbecue might be a, a good fit, we know that there are barbecue businesses that have been downtown that aren't there anymore, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, there's, there's, there's more to it there sure. than, than just trying to match up your demographics, I guess. Right. Because that what actually what that's saying is that your business model is critical, that, that you make sure that your model matches what, um, what your customers out there expect and, and are wanting, even if they don't know it yet. That's what, well, Tom was referring to that, that leakage report. I didn't show it up there, but um, the leakage report is a good way for us to see maybe what businesses should be selling during those shoulder seasons when tourism tourists aren't here. Um, maybe businesses need to focus on two stocks of product, maybe one during tourism, and then they switch out just like a lot of retailers do. They switch out to another stock that locals would like to buy. I think COVID brought much more of a focus on shopping local than ever before. Right. Um, but there's still talk about, you know, or they're not buying this here, they're not buying this here. But, you know, we can probably use this to that extent too. Maybe, maybe look at products that we should be looking at during the shoulder seasons. Um, that'd be a good use for this. And that really would be more the leakage report. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, so we should, we should, we should sit down sometime. If you're interested, let's sit down. I want to do this with all the council members anyway. So we should sit down. I could show you the whole thing. Yeah. Yep. Whatever works. Yeah. No, one-on-one -on -one is great. Individual basis. Yeah. Individual basis. Yeah, that works. That's, that's the easiest way to, to dig into it or to, you know. But it's it's pretty it's a cool tool it's it's pretty powerful, but one of the things one uh, more related to your comment before, talking about um, the chains, there's there's always talk about not wanting chains here, but when when you think about the potential for downtown with Unbridled and their business model, employing all of downtown it really gives you much more of, a, of a, an event center mall type of a concept. And if we could bring in, even if it's a chain, but if we could bring in a restaurant or something that could 
drive activity and create that momentum. Once we create that momentum, then other investors are going to be more likely to want to open up shop and fill up those vacancies. So that's, that's kind of the direction of trying to go. I don't necessarily want to bring in a big chain that's going to, you know, a bunch of big chains, but if there's something that can generate activity downtown, who's interested in being downtown, because they all want to be on Highway 50, um, then that can create some momentum for more activity, more investment. The thing I like about a chain also is that you had mentioned their business model. They all have business models that work and mm -hmm. they're successful. They're so, you know, even though we've had a barbecue joint downtown, um, if we brought in serious Texas barbecue, they've got a chain that works, you know, so their business model is working. Like Starbucks, they're a chain mm -hmm. and they've got a business model that works. And Starbucks is one of those companies that drives investment. Yeah. You know, that's one of those trigger companies that, and there's another, there's another developer we're talking to about a gas station. He, they also, they're also preferred builder for Starbucks and he's disappointed because there's one here already. So, oh. <laughs> you know, he wants to build one here. Yeah, we said, another. build another one, you know, but. I'd hit them both. So, you know, it's sometimes it's match and sometimes it's momentum to, to spur the investment. So that's what we need I to create. Yeah. Okay, anything else for us? No, unless you've got more questions, no. Okay, well, thank you for coming and presenting. It was pretty interesting and, uh, and very enlightening. Well, thank you. And with that, thank we'll you. close the meeting. You're welcome.